so, so for the first part, I'll, I'll just give a brief introduction on uh, how to use PyTorch or like some Python basics to build machine learning pipelines. So we'll start with a very simple example, say MNIST classification that every, everyone in machine learning should be familiar with. Um, so the, the, the package that we're going to be using uh, is mainly like those PyTorch packages, so torch.nn which we abbreviated as nn, torch.nn.functional, which we abbreviated as f. So nn uh, has a lot of modules on neural networks, and function, functional has a lot of uh, uh, functions, function definitions that's related to neural network operations. Um, uh, these two are just specific for uh, uh, MNIST, which uh, you don't have to care. And then the last one is uh, the matrix, which we use to do perform evaluations of, uh, of uh, the model. So I've already uh, ran this because, uh, so, so here in the second part, this is just uh, loading the data set. So this is going to take a little bit. So I just ran it uh, before, before I came. Um, but uh, I guess the thing that you have to know here is that uh, uh, before you start training, you have to uh, get a sense of um, 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 the, the concept of data set. So this is like the data structure that PyTorch keeps for you to uh, get input for the model. So these are uh, these are storing all the data set. In this case, this is the MNIST data set. And for later on, we're going to use, uh, say, Sightseer, uh, Enzyme, uh, IMDB, these uh, other kind of graph data sets, but all in the format of this um, PyTorch uh, data set object. And um, so here, uh, this is where we define the training set. This is the loader that loads the training set. So the, uh, what this PyTorch data set is really is, it's just uh, inheriting from some abstract uh, data set format that uh, is an iterable. So the main functions that you want to inherit when you build your own data set is the thing called LAN, which is the length of the iterable, and also the index. Like You'll be able to index into specific examples into the data set. For example, um, uh, maybe I can show here. So this train set thing. Uh, oops. So, uh, so this train set is just uh, uh, just this thing here, which is a PyTorch data set. Oh, it's going to take a bit. But, but you can also do something that's very common to like, uh, um, um, very common to uh, any iterable, Python iterable, which is like you can print the length of the iterable and you can, uh, and you can print, say, what's the first example, uh, like any index that you can put in. So this basically retrieves you the tenth example of the thing. Hmm. It's still running. Why is this so slow? Uh, were you able to download the data set? OK, cool. And you should be getting some results. Okay, but um, but this is what you uh, what you have to do for iter um, for iterating over the data set. So you can index into a data set to retrieve one one example from the training set. But in practice, what we do is mini batch training, right? We do stochastic gradient descent, which means that at every iteration or at every yeah at every iteration, you're taking multiple uh, examples. So this is also the way like you take multiple examples. You can take like say 10, 11, 12, or like after shuffling or something like that. So yes, so this is the basic concept of data set. And, and as you can see, like it will print out the uh, number of data set. Uh, this was actually the previous run. So it printed out the, the data set itself. But like now I'm printing out the length of the training set. And I can also print out uh, like the specific data, data example that is, that's here. So basically, this array is just an image array of uh, 26 by 26, which represents the MNIST digit. So. Uh, so okay, so so once you once you constructed the uh, maybe we can just uh, yes. So once you constructed the data set, now it's the time to construct the model. And so we will do like this: we first construct data set, we, we then build our model, and then we link the model and the data set together to uh, to do training and testing. So uh, here it's a very brief or very simple example of like an MLP with comp one one layer of convolution, this like really simple model just to demonstrate how, how we'd use uh, PyTorch to uh, uh, build this kind of, uh, uh, build kind of network. Uh, just show of hands, how many people are familiar with like PyTorch concepts? 
okay, like half of it. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll explain a bit more in detail. So every model in uh, so uh, every model that you build in PyTorch is uh, inheriting from something called like NN dot module, which is like a super class of um, any neural network module. So this provides uh, a lot of good things that you will later see, you know, like it provides easy interface to uh, optimize, uh, easy interface to run inference and, and training on that model. So uh, this module mainly has like two functions that you have to implement. One is initialization and one is the forward function. So the initialization basically helps you to define all the parameters that you use uh, uh, um, it in the model. So these are the places where you put in all the trainable parameters and later on you can retrieve these parameters in your optimizer and optimize for these parameters. Right? And and the second part is the forward function. So the what the forward function does is um, it basically tells you how to construct the computation graph from the input to the output. Right? In this case, the parameters that we we care here is just a convolution, 2D convolution, which you don't need need in in graph neural nets. But um, um, and then the the second one is the linear layer. The third one is also linear layer. So these are all the parameters that we use to train this model. And here we're defining so linear layer has two inputs: the input channel and the output channel. So these are pretty useful because we will uh, see a lot of linear layers in, in, in graph neural nets. So here uh, the input is something like uh, 26 by 26, which is the size of the image. And then 32 is the number of channels because we noticed that the number of output channels is 32. So here, this is the input dimension and this is the output dimension. I have a hidden layer of 128 neurons. And in the second convolution, I take in this uh, number of output uh, here, and then I output 10. I output 10 because this is a classification task, right? Uh, so this is classifying which digit is the MNIST uh, number is. So uh, the possible number of possible digit is 0 to 9. So this is like a 10 class classification task. Right? Um, and, and in the forward function, this is what we do. We, we take an input x. So the forward function takes in the input of the actual tensor, and then it builds the, com uh, it builds the computation graph here. Um, so the notion of computation graph actually like starts from TensorFlow, um, but the good thing about PyTorch, that which also makes it easier, is that you don't have to pre-construct your entire computation graph before feeding all your data. So you can actually like on the fly retrieve your data from your computation graph, look at it, uh, maybe even modify it, and then feed it back to uh, feed it feed it back into your computation graph. So it's like dynamic. Yes. Uh, sure. Um, Again, it's not gonna be important for this class, but uh, the shape uh, for the convolution uh, has like three parameters. One is kernel size, which is like the the filter size, the filter dimensions, which is three by three in this case. And the input channel is one because this is a black and white image, so uh, just like a grayscale. Uh, so input channel is one because it's one dimension, and output channel is thirty-two. It's just like the conf output channel for the yeah, uh, but it's not gonna be used for graph neural nets. Uh, it's just there for image classification. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, why is like thirty two plus one plus in the forward function? I'm sorry. In the forward function, the first comment about the shapes of the. In the uh, first the forward function. X the batch. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. So so there's like a batch dimension here. So the thirty two in this case is the batch size. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, this is variable. So uh, there's also like a flatten here, which means that you flatten this like multi-dimensional array to one dimension. This can also be very useful in graph neural nets, by the way. And this is not the only way. So uh, this way, this is actually the flatten is actually an op operation that connects the the uh, the input tensor, which is this x, to a very uh, to a different tensor, which is also assigned to x. So you first do the computation on x, and then you you put the resulting value back to x, right? Um, but this could be a little bit expensive. Like what we usually also be able to do is like uh, we can use this like view function like this one. Uh, I think uh, so the tensor dot view, and um, we just specify like because we want to flatten it to uh, thirty two by uh, whatever the the rest of the dimension. So just negative one here. So this essentially does the same thing with flatten. Uh, but the good thing about this is that it doesn't actually uh, does the actual computation of uh, changing the shape of the x. It just providing a different view of this tensor. So a different view mean, means like I look at it differently, but it's uh, in the same memory in the memory. So uh, it's a little bit more efficient. But computationally, they are equivalent. These two are equivalent. Uh, yeah. 
Oh, you can, by the way, you can look at the documentation of the view in the uh, uh, PyTorch uh, tensor uh, documentation. But, uh, so after this computation, we do nonlinearity, um, and we produce a logit. Uh, logit is uh, essentially the 10 class here. The output is dimension 10. So 10 class, we pass through a softmax on the logit, which the logit is the 10 class score. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with softmax, um, it's just a way to differentiably differentiate kind of max, right? So uh, say I, I provide a score for each of the uh, for each of the candidate class, and I use this particular function uh, uh, into the power of uh, c i over uh, sum of root to the power of c j for j equals to one, right? So uh, so this will be uh, the probability of the model choosing that particular class. This is just basic softmax. Um, and then with this softmax, we can use like cross entropy to compute the actual loss. Right? Uh, is, is, uh, is the basics about PyTorch uh, clear? Is there any questions on PyTorch? OK, cool. cool. So, so once we define the model, we can uh, actually start uh, working on uh, like um, actually running this model. Right? So maybe maybe let's let's first start with a very simple example where we don't actually train the model, but just like to look at like what these tensors are. Like for example, we can define a equals to is numpy. Uh, so we, we can say define a equals to some kind of tensor. Right. So this is not a tensor. This is a numpy array. Uh, NumPy is not defined. So this is a NumPy array. Um, everyone is familiar with NumPy array, right? Um, and we can define something like np dot once. Um, we can do uh, like similar things, right? Uh, this is just a two by two matrix of ones. Right? And if you print b, it will be a two by two matrix of ones, right? And and in NumPy, we can do operations like matmol, right? You can do mu matrix multiplication between these two. So you can do mp dot matmol a b. So this will give you the matrix multiplication between matrix A and matrix B, which turns out to be this. But uh, this is in NumPy, and which is also uh, which is just using CPU for your computer. Um, but um, the good thing about PyTorch is that you can do this linear computation in like GPU. So you, you notice that like here our runtime type is set to GPU here. So which which means that we have a GPU available. So we can do this uh, using PyTorch on GPU. So what we do here is that we can define this thing called tensor, which is the uh, the object like PyTorch object that they use to perform the computation. So the tensor A is. Um, uh, something like uh, torch dot tensor, and then you put in this uh, numpy array. So it will. So if you print the ta now, this is going to be a pytorch tensor which is wrapped around the the numpy array, right? Uh, you can also define the data type um, uh, float, I know. right? So it now you it tells you I this is using float sixty four, right? Um, and we can do the same thing for another. And so here we can do either torch.tensor B, but we can also do like torch.ones. So you, you notice a lot of similarity between calling NumPy function and calling the, the PyTorch function. So uh, is it this one? So now we print TB. All right, so, um, and we can also define D type similarly uh, float. This is all very similar to uh, the NumPy interface, so it's very easy to use. And now you can perform computation using torch functions. Right? So now, instead of calling the numpy.matmore, I can do um, torch.matmore, right? So T A T B. So this will give you matrix multiplication using PyTorch. Right? Um, and or just as like a very simple shortcut is uh, just do this which also gives you the matrix modification, right? But the, uh, here, the, all the tensors still live in CPU because we just tell the PyTorch to construct this tensor, but it's still in CPU. So the way that you do GPU is that uh, you can look at what the GPU is available. So um, Torch Okuda is available. 
this will give you true. So now, because our runtime, as you noticed, is GPU, so it says CUDA is available. And because it's available, we can now do something like transferring the data into GPU. And the way you do it is um, the very simple way is this. You just um, let the, uh, the torch put it to any GPU that you can specify. So now, if you print this thing called TB, sorry, TA, whatever, um, it will give you something in the GPU. Okay, yeah, the first time transferring data is a bit, a bit slow, but you notice that it's, there's like a device, for, um, device thing that wasn't there before, so now this means that it's in GPU. Right? Um, but uh, a lot of times that you want to make sure specific like which GPU you want to actually use. So this, this time you want to call two device. So, uh, so device is something like uh, uh, essentially this string there. So in this case, we only get one GPU, so uh, this is the GPU that we are using, so uh, so it's like that. Right? So, but it's equivalent. It gives you the same results. So, is there any question on like uh, GPU using GPU, PyTorch tensor stuff? Okay, great. So it's easy. Okay. Um, so yeah. So here it's the same thing. Here we just define I if the CUDA is available, we set it to CUDA zero. Otherwise, we use CPU as the as the device. Right, now we to use the two call that I used before to get to the device. And this is how we construct the model. Um, and then we define the loss. So, so this is the loss that we use to, uh, um, uh, to uh, compute the, uh, the difference between our train softmax versus the ground truth label, which is like one digit out of 10 digits. Right? And then this is the optimizer. So um, a lot of optimizers are there. So you can look at the tor the torch dot optim dot uh, whatever like there are a bunch of things like uh, SGD RSGD uh, 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 add a grad add a delta uh, a bunch of those uh, and you can you can try whether these fit you and uh, there's one thing that's in like worth looking at because a lot of times um, you want the learning rate to be uh, kind of annealing over time, right? Uh, initially, because the model is not very, very trained very well, you want the learning rate to be big, so so you can like step with big steps, and then later on you want the learning rate to be decaying or like annealing. So there's an option called schedule in the um, in the optimization package. So uh, there's like different kind of annealing uh, annealing uh, operations that you can do. There's like step annealing. There's like linear annealing. There's uh, exponential annealing. There's also something interesting called cosine annealing, which uh, people in vision likes. So, um, so yes. So uh, you're encouraged to look at this, but uh, it's not strictly necessary. But it will, it could improve your performance. Um, so once you run this, uh, I probably have already run it. Um, then you can start the training. So we have everything ready. We have the model ready. We have the data set ready. We have the optimizer ready. We have the loss ready. So now we can uh, do the training. So the, the training uh, loop essentially goes like this. So there's an, um, a fixed number of epochs that we need to go through. Um, typically, like, like this just represents like the, the number of times you need to go through the entire data set. Right? Um, uh, we're also recording the loss and stuff. Um, and then, okay, so here is for each of the epoch where you go through the entire set of data. Now we enumerate over the data loader. Right? Re remember that data loader is a wrapper around the data set, which is like, which you can index into. So this enumeration here uh, just tells you like, um, at every iteration, you want to extract the number of examples equal to your batch size. By the way, batch size is also defined in the loader. So now for every iteration, this is uh, the, the thing that's uh, that is retrieved from the data set. Remember the train train set, I said train set 10. So this is the thing that's in the train set 10. So here in this case is image and label, right? So we put everything into GPU, we perform the model. So when uh, so when you see see like the model and then parentheses, um, the input, this means that this is calling the input function, sorry, calling the forward function of the model. So this, this is the function that it calls, right? So the input here is X. Uh, which is the image, and that's why we put the image into the model, right? Um, so um, once you do that, there's an important, uh, sorry, the loss uh, is of course, the loss is the uh, cross entropy loss, which you can look up, it's, it's very standard cross entropy. Uh, um, but here there's an 
an important step that you really need to do, which is uh, zero grad. Uh, zero grad basically sets the gradient to zero for all the variables. This is very important because if you don't do this by default, the uh, the PyTorch is gonna accumulate your gradient, right? Uh, say like your previous, you have already computed your gradient for all your parameters in your previous iteration. If you don't do zero grad, it's gonna add back the gradient of the current computation. So it's gonna be a sum of your previous gradient plus the current gradient. And this is not what you want uh, in a lot of times. So you really need to call zero grad if you want this kind of behavior. Um, and um, and um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is a function where we compute gradient. So backward uh, means backprop. So uh, backprop computes all the gradients for you, for all the parameters uh, that you define. So uh, if you don't, uh, forgot where the parameters are, these are the parameters. Right. For linear, the parameter is the weights, weight, and the bias. For so the weight will equal to this. The number of elements in weight is equal to the input times the output, and the number of uh, elements in the bias term is uh, the number of output. Right. So, so these are the parameters, and when we call backward, uh, all the gradients of these parameters are computed. And now we do optimizer dot <coughs> optimizer dot step. So when we call optimizer dot step. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're saying for all, these, for all these parameters where we already have gradient, we want to per perform one step optimization with the learning rate that's specified here. Right. So, uh, and also, okay, maybe I'll also explain the parameters function call. So this is just a, so it's, it's perfectly fine if you put a list of parameters there, but this model of parameters is just a, a abbreviation to help you, so say like, uh, I want to optimize all the parameters that is defined in init. So this is what you do, right? You, you just call parameters and then it will help you. Uh, so it's essentially giving you all the parameters here. Um, and how do you decide, uh, is there anyone has a clue, how do you decide whether uh, uh, a, a, a parameter here is included in, uh, in uh, model.parameters? Uh, is there like say, for example, if I do something like this, say, um, x equals to nn dot linear 5, 5. Uh, is x optimized? Uh, is x included in model dot parameter? No. Yes. Good. So is, uh, anyone know why it does, it's not included? It's a very, it's a very tricky thing. So, OK. So, so the, the reason that x is not included here is that I didn't add self. If, if I do this, this is in the parameters. It, it's, it's in model dot parameters. Uh, the m this is just like a very um, specific thing about nn dot module. Like you have to define this self for the model to uh, for the parameters to be included in the optimizer so that you can optimize. And, and uh, there's also a caveat. Like say I want to have like a list of parameters I want to optimize. Say I have a three layer neural network. Say I, I have this for i in range three, oh range four, whatever. Uh, so if I if I have oh, if I have this. Um, Anyone know why? Uh, uh, anyone know if uh, this is included in the parameter list? So this will also not be included in the parameter list, even if you have self. But because this is a list, so it's not being included. So what you do instead is do n n n dot module list, uh, and then you put the list there. In which case, it will be in the model dot parameters, and you can optimize that. Um, yeah, just like. Whenever, like sometimes you don't see the loss coming down, or you don't see the op the parameter changing, it could just be because that the the parameters are not actually in your model dot parameter list, so you didn't actually optimize that. So it's good if you know this and know how to debug those. Right. Uh, make sure that the your list of parameters is the list of things that you want to optimize. Right. Okay. So now we can we can perform training. So this is essentially the entire training loop that I just explained. Uh, I explained until this step, which is optimization, uh, optimizer.step. And there's also um, accumulating the loss. And, but these are very simple py Python stuff. Right. Um, and note that this is the label. So I will talk about it later on the evaluation metric. I will explain what this is. But um, just to get a sense, this is like how you train neural nets, like going through a lot of epochs. So here I'm recording the epoch 0, which is here. But there's, uh, we can go through the data multiple times to get results. 
So okay, so let's talk about testing. So I assume that you guys know basic concepts about like test sets, uh, training set, right? Um, the basic idea is that you want to evaluate how good our model is, uh, um, but you um, but you don't want to use your training set to evaluate it, right? Because you only train on this, so there's a possibility that you overfit on the training set, but the model doesn't generalize to data that you have not seen before. So this is the how you do the test set. So uh, the thing about test is that the evaluation metric does not have to be have to be differentiable, right? The tra your training loss has to be differentiable because then you can do SGD. But your test uh, test metric need not be differentiable. And uh, these are typically things like precision recall F1, things like that. Um, is there any question? Okay, cool. Okay, um, this is just training. I can kill this. It's not important. Okay. Um, but you will see like loss sort of going down and all that. Uh, so in the test, um, uh, we basically want to evaluate how good it is. So what we do is we take a different set of uh, uh, data in the data set. So here, uh, see the test loader. So test loader is constructed from the test set, not the training set. So you, you notice from the previous uh, code section that these are two different data sets. Uh, but the, the idea is the same. We enumerate over the entire uh, test set. And for the images, we go to GPU. For labels, we go to GPU. And we produce our model output. And remember that the model output is this thing, right? It's the softmax that we kind of computed from the from the model set, uh, from the model class. And and okay, so this is uh, maybe I need to decompose this. So um, so this is essentially the model output. And then out of all the scores that we computed this way, we want to pick the maximum of these to be our class, right? So say like the model predicts zero with possibility, 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.1. 1 with possibility 0 0.1, but 2 with possibility 0 0.8, right? So you would say, like, the model actually thinks that the digit is 2, right? So in which case, we are picking the argmax. So essentially, you, are, uh, you can treat this as, as your predictions. So torch.argmax, which tells you the maximum is, outputs 1, right? Um, and, and of course, uh, you can flatten, for sure. So, so uh, this is your prediction. And, uh, and this is your labels, right? So we can we can print both. Uh, we can print labels. We can also print predictions, and we just run it for one iteration. So uh, you just just to let you know like what this looks like. So this is the our prediction. The model predicts seven. The label is actually seven. Uh, it's all correct, right? No, it, uh, it, uh, well, it's all correct. Okay. So, but we want to evaluate based on these model outputs and the labels, right? Um, so what, what we want to do here uh, is that we um, we can make use of the, uh, remember the library that I just talked, uh, like I mentioned uh, at the beginning. So there's like this sklearn matrix, which helps you, uh, which already defines a lot of metric function that you can use, for example, accuracy, for example, precision, etc. cetera. So, um, so here, we are computing accuracy ourselves using mean and items, but uh, we don't have to do that. We can just make use of the sklearn. But the thing is, sklearn is implemented based on NumPy, so you have to convert this thing back to NumPy. And the way you convert this thing back to NumPy is you call CPU, because this thing is in GPU right now, remember? And um, also, also, you need to compute the NumPy, so uh, convert to NumPy. Is that clear? And and I can do the same thing for the labels, uh, labels dot CPU, just convert back to NumPy, right? And then I can make use of my favorite sklearn uh, dot metric. Uh, I like have already say there's a lot of different uh, different uh, uh, functions in it. So almost all the evaluation methods that you can think of is already implemented. So you can basically call a lot of different things. For example, precision. Um, remember, precision is false positive, true positive over what? True positive plus true negative. No, true positive plus false positive. Yes, true positive plus, plus false positive. So, uh, so this is how you compute the precision score. Um, you can print the precision, precision. I'm 
just going to run for one iteration. Oh. Hmm. Oh, so, so here this is a multi-class classification, uh, but by default average is binary, which is, not, which is only for binary classification. So in which case you want to do, what's it called? Average uh, micro, say you do micro average of 10 class. Oh, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, I, yeah, I guess don't care about this. So now position is one, but then you can do different other things, right? Recall. Um, and there's PR curve, there's everything, like you can do it this way. Um, but okay, so um, let's remove these just to let you know that you can use sklearn to perform all these evaluations. And in this case, uh, it's doing test accuracy, which means that, so, Right now, just now, I printed the precision recall for one iteration. Now here, I need to aggregate over all the iterations of the data set so to get overall accuracy, which is happens to be 0 0.99. So yeah, th so that's the basic, uh, that's all for the basic uh, tutorial for the PyTorch. Uh, is there any questions on PyTorch uh, related training ML models? Um, is everyone following? Yes. But how did the loss get taken into account in the, in the uh, training? How did the training? How are loss and your variables loss and optimizer linked together? Oh, the question is how is the loss and uh, optimizer linked together? So they don't link direct uh, linked together directly. So what you see here is that you compute gradient of the loss. So when, when we say loss.backward, it computes gradients of all the parameters in the model, right? This is the signal from the loss function. So once you get the gradient for all the parameters, then optimizer here only cares about parameters. So you realize that optimizer takes in the set of all the parameters, right? And all the parameters have already been computed the gradient. So, uh, so once you call optimizer step, it just take all the parameters, look at their gradient, and it performs one step optimization. Um, is that clear? The loss is constructed from criteria, which is separate from your optimizer. Uh, yes, exactly. That, that's that's the point. So, so the loss is not relate directly related to optimizer. Loss d is related to your gradients. So, loss tells you the gradient of all the parameters. And then, based on all the gradient you compute, your optimizer comes in, look at the gradient, and perform one step optimization based on these gradients. So the loss and optimizer themselves do not call each other. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The the general idea is that you you compute gradient for all the parameters, and then you perform optimizers based on these gradients. So you don't have to look at the loss to compute compute your optimal uh, compute your step because you already know all the gradients of your parameters uh, okay so okay so we'll uh, we'll then cover the Python geometric so before uh, covering the Python geometric I'll just say like uh, this is just one library that we can use we think is like uh, easy to use but it's not like the thing that you have to follow there are a bunch of uh, libraries like graph nets um, from Google if you're interested in TensorFlow. And there's also uh, DGL, which is from uh, Amazon that supports both PyTorch and MXNet. So there are different kind of uh, frameworks uh, that you can use. Um, and this is just like one way to, um, like as an example of how to do this. Um, but you can, if you want, you can also implement it from scratch. It's actually not that hard as you would think because uh, I think in your slides, there's also like one slide about how to do the computation, which essentially says like, you just do the uh, matrix multiplication of your adjacency, of your weight function, of your feature matrix. You can do this uh, matrix multiplication in PyTorch. So you can even write it from scratch. It's not that hard. Um, but this is just a way to like help you uh, um, provide additional utilities for you to write it. So I already uh, installed the, the libraries here. Um, and these are the set of dependencies that we would need uh, for the PyTorch model. 
uh, a Python geometric model. So uh, I, let me just briefly explain. You already seen this, and here, uh, here these two are specific to Python geometric. So this NN module here is uh, the neural network module that's specific to Python geometric. So it, it implements a lot of things like graph conf, gene conf, and like different kind of graph convolution models. Um, and the UTO here is basically performs some uh, graph uh, graph utilities uh, functions. Um, so we also use network X to just um, visualize the graph. It's not important and it's not necessary. Uh, optimizers. So these are the data sets that we would use. So this um, the good thing is that a lot of standard graph data sets are already like easily port, uh, ported to these uh, libraries. So you can just uh, download them automatically from uh, from Python Geometric. But um, but if you have custom data sets. Uh, it's also easy to build them, like as I show in the the PyTorch dataset function. Uh, okay, um, and here are a bunch of things uh, that helps you to perform visualizations. So I like TensorBoard X. So this is basically an interface between PyTorch and uh, TensorBoard. Um, uh, for those of you who have not used TensorBoard, this is just a way to track your training, like how how well you perform over time. Um, like you can see, uh, like plot a graph of a loss with respect to the number of epochs, or like metric like accuracy with number of epochs and so on. So it's very easy to track those during your training. And I'll show how to do this. And this is for your TSNE visualization. So you want to embed the the learn embedding into like a two dimension thing that's easy to visualize. This is how um, this is one way to do it. And finally, um, this is just a plot, bad plot, lib plot function. Um, okay, so um, so let's start with the uh, how to write the a, a general model for GraphConf, assuming that you already built a um, or use a built-in uh, convolution operation that uh, that Python geometry already defined. Right. So this is uh, just a stack of graph convolutions, like very simple model here. Um, and as you already uh, know from uh, from the previous uh, previous example, that uh, this is a model, so it inherits from the nn dot module. The torture is not actually necessary, I think. So because I already right. so it's inheriting from uh, nn dot module. So uh, so there is like the initializer which you have to implement, and there is also like the forward which you have to implement. So it's the same. Um, but uh, but there's a few more things uh, that you have to put in here. Uh, for example, here I was using the module list, which I talked about before. Uh, so here you put in all your convolution operations. So here uh, I'm putting in um, a convolution model that takes in the number of input dimensions and number of output dimensions. And I'm also building two additional layers of uh, convolution here, right here. So this is going from hidden to hidden. right? Uh, the hidden dimension, the input is hidden dimension, the output is also hidden dimension. Um, and and we can look at the build conf, it's really very simple. I'm just saying like if it's like a node classification, I'm using the most simple GC conf, the graph convolutional networks. And here, um, uh, if it's a graph conf convolution, I'm using a particular model called gene uh, for graph model, but we'll look at how to implement this later. So you can even like input your custom count function, and this is actually the 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 function that uh, we are asking you to implement in the homework, right? The the class uh, that is subclass from the message passing superclass. Right. So here, um, here after the convolution, I also have additional parameters here, like a sequential sequential here is very similar to module list. So we define a list of these. Uh, these layers, um, and and the difference here is that if we call sequential, that means we execute all these layers sequentially, whereas in module list you can execute out of order or in whichever way that you like. So this so this sequential always executes sequentially. So you perform this first linear layer and then drop out and then second linear layer. Right. Um, okay. Is there a question on the mod? Okay. Good. Um, so we again we talk about the the forward function, but this forward function is uh, kind of specific to graph neural networks. Right? So this forward function takes in um, 
uh, takes in the data, which is the, uh, which is your input. So so this data is an element of the data set. Remember the PyTorch data set that I talked about. You can index into every element of the data set to get an object here called data. So the data here consists of x, which is the feature feature matrix. Um, is uh, the dimension is number of nodes times the number of nodes embedding dimensions, right? um, and or node feature dimensions. And there is also edge index. You can see edge index as like an adjacency matrix, sparse adjacency list. Uh, um, basically, says like what are the edges in your graph. So if if there is an edge between node one, and node two, here there is um, uh, the first row is one, two, right, and three, four, one, three. So this is a adjacency list of the graph. And uh, here is the batch. Uh, the batch is a little bit complicated because uh, now um, now we need to so instead of batching images, which is like regular having the same number of nodes, now we need to batch graphs. So we, as we all know, graphs have different number of nodes. So if we want to batch a lot of graphs together, especially in graph classification, then we want to know which node actually belongs to which graph. So this is telling you like which node belongs to which graph. Right. So internally, it's an array that says. Um, the like which node for every el element of the array, uh, you record which graph it belongs to. So, in practice, you see something like one 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 one, which means there are five nodes uh, that belongs to graph one, and then followed by say two two two, which means there are th three nodes in graph two, and so on. So this is a batch of uh, some number of graphs, and. If it's node classification, as we will see here, um, so there are a lot of node classification that only runs on one graph. So in which case, the batch here is like all ones. So it's like a trivial kind of graph. Um, so here we have um, 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 we have just a sanity ch uh, check that if there's no features, uh, we use constant feature. Uh, we also talked about it in class. and. And here we have a number of layers that execute the convolution. Um, so here, uh, comps I remember this comps is a module list here. So this is a module list, which has a list of uh, list of these elements. For every element is a layer, right? It is a convolution layer. So uh, for I in these many layers, for every layer I'm performing one different convolution. Here, pass uh, um, and then uh, pass through a value and drop out, right? So uh, one thing about dropout is that there is also this training flag here, which you might want to take a look because uh, dropout computation is different for training and testing. As you all know, like at test time, uh, uh, you cannot, uh, you have to rescale the value. So that's because, right? It's because training at training time you drop out, so the magnitude of the all the all the outputs is kind of larger. So at the test time, you kind of want to downwind that. So you have to. You have to um, specify whether you are in training or not, so that the dropout knows how do you compute this. So at test time, it just passes through everything. At training time, it will drop out. Right. Um, so, and lastly, uh, we said um, if this is a graph, uh, if if this is a graph task. So here, I just mean like we are doing graph classification rather than node classification. You have you need to do a pooling mechanism, which we also discuss. Mm -hmm. So you need to pull all the node in. Oh yes, please. Uh, sorry for interrupting. In the previous part, you had a uh, pi g e n n dot g c n convolution. That yes. that creates a convolutional layer. Yes. Right. Okay. And and then the and then just specify the parameters to like kind of specify how big the layer is. Yes. Yes. Okay. So so yes. So uh, the question is here. We have this pi uh, g n n uh, dot g c n conf. So this defines one layer of convolution. And we are now simply stacking together a bunch of these layers, as shown here. We have a for loop that stacks all these layers, and and every layer here does has its own parameters. So these parameters will be internally defined in this gcconf function, uh, gcconf module class that I will explain later. So the parameters are not uh, are not directly defined in this model, but defined inside these convolution layers of individual layers. Okay. Um, yes, um, just to continue, um, if this is a graph classification, we need to do pooling. This is one way to pull. Uh, we can do main pool, and I think the homework does max pool, but doesn't matter. Um, 
different kinds of pulling mechanisms that you can also call. So you can also refer to the package to understand like what kind of pulling mechanisms are there. And in general, it's also an interesting research uh, topic of like how do you actually pull all the nodes together into a into one graph embedding. So here, global mean pool just means I'm taking average of all the node embeddings. Oh, and here is the post MP. Remember, the post MP is defined by this sequential MLP here. Um, oh, and and that's it. And log softmax is again doing this softmax with log, so that you can do cross entropy. Um, I'm also returning embedding here because I want to later visualize what the what the uh, what the graph looks like or what the embedding le is is learned to be. So I'm just returning embedding also. And for the loss, because now we computed log softmax, we just need to do the negative log likelihood of the uh, of the predicted log softmax with respect to the uh, true label distribution, which is a one hot distribution of the label class. So. As you can see, this is uh, for node classification and graph classification, and this is the general model that um, that is also like very similar to your homework. Um, of course, in homework, you, uh, I was asking to like implement some a few more details, and then also in graph state we have like specific conversion models. But this is the, the general homework. Um, okay, so now we can talk about like what is GCN, uh, GCN conv, and gene conv really is. So. Uh, ooh. So uh, these convolutions um, are like a concept defined by top high touch geometric. So this is uh, the class. So all these gene conf and GCN conf inherits from this uh, message passing class. Uh, have I already run this? Run this. OK. So here uh, we're saying like maybe we come up with our, our own convolution module. Maybe we have like special needs that we want to do or like we have special ideas we want to implement so we don't want to follow the standard GCN conf. So here is how you implement the custom convolution layers. So your our custom convolution layers is also inheriting from message passing and um, and notes that the aggregation here uh, we when when we call our superclass, we define the aggregation function here. So here we we just add all the messages together. So that's add, and we can also take mean, max, and all these here. So, but we we do add here. Um, so yes, the the previous students was asking the parameters where are they defined. So here is where it is defined. So here we have a linear layer. Uh, linear like the parameters in the linear layer that's uh, defined for that specific uh, convolution and as usual because this nn dot message passing is a subclass of nn dot module in PyTorch we also implement both the init and forward function it's all the same right it's like module inside a module inside a module so um, in this forward function because this is graph neural nets we have two things that we want to we want to uh, use as input. One is the connectivity, which is the adjacency list in the edge index, and one is the feature matrix, which is X here. Uh, and I also uh, have the shapes listed here. The N is number of nodes. Uh, this is the number of input dimensions. Um, edge is number of, so two here just means like every edge you have two nodes, right? You want to specify the two nodes. And here is number of edges here. Um, did something like, um, Add self loop. This is just means that um, in G because in GCN we do something like this, right? Uh, we did we do something like the uh, right um, apply to a nonlinearity non feature matrix and so on, right? So so here. Um, So, so here, the edge, um, the the self loop basically means that my a is different. So, um, so I also also want to add myself into into your convolution. So you not only aggregate neighbors, you also like add yourself. Self. This just means that your a is actually like not actually your a, but this is actually a plus your self loop kind of thing. Um, and that is implementing that, but we can change it a little bit also. So. 
uh, for example, like there's a lot of customization that can be done here, right? Uh, you don't have to add self loop, and there's actually like a remove self loop over here. So you like make sure you don't do self edges. And the reason we don't do self edges is that then we can do like a skip layer on top of that. So what we do is, um, okay, so I have like say, I transform my edge, uh, I, I transform my um, um, x axis, and then uh, I do the propagation. So this propagation. Uh, what this does is it's calling the message function, so it computes the messages for all the nodes, and then does the aggregation to get the the new representation based on your neighborhood defined by the edge list. But then I can do a skip uh, uh, um, skip connection here, which means that I I can define say I another another uh, linear layer for say lane self. So I defined another, just defined another linear layer, and then I want your self embedding to be um, uh, passing through that uh, linear layer, and then I want the rest, the messages to pass in, uh, to pass through this linear layer. So what we do is here, instead of passing in the message itself, I pass in the the, the linear layer here, uh, like that. So we don't need this. And and this is um, this is how we propagate all your neighbor information, and what you can do is you you can also add your self information, which is self, which is what we just computed here, right? Uh, is that clear? Like uh, I add myself, and then I add all the neighborhood messages that we aggregate from the propagate function. So the propagate function is propagating all your neighborhood information, and uh, the thing that we are propagating is this, like x pass through a linear layer. Yes, please. Yes. So here the aggregation sort of happens behind the scenes. We don't have to manually tell it to aggregate. Exactly. Yes. So the edge list is telling it how to aggregate. So it's using the edge list to define the neighborhood of the node where you want to pass messages. So you don't have to write the... the so essentially, the, this package is helping you to do that. That's the only thing that is helpful. Uh, um, yeah. So here, uh, messages... Um, it's just computing message. I know that a lot of things here and here you can like kind of switch places. It's not like, in, uh, um, but it's just that. So the message function is called inside propagate. So, oh uh, yes. Uh, super I mean like uh, when you put super as a top, what does it does in The question is, what is super here? Super here means that I'm calling the super class of the of the current class. So here we see custom count is inheriting from uh, nm dot message passing, which is inheriting from nm dot module. So when I call super here, I'm calling the constructor or the initialization function of the message passing class. Okay, it, it will not uh, work if uh, we have we have done, we have done uh, custom point init without super. It will not uh, work. It will not work. Then you're calling yourself. Yeah. Yes, you have to call super. Um, and it's best to call it before everything in your init because then you get all the, like PyTorch and then module is initialized first before you define everything. Um, and here I'm doing a lot of computation here just uh, because I want to do this thing. So this is the GCN conf. I'm essentially reproducing the GCN conf, but so you don't have to do this. Like. Like if you just want to add all your neighbors, because there's a paper that shows that adding like ag aggregation by adding all your neighbors is best for graph classification. You don't actually um, need all these, right? Um, you just use yourself as messages. And alternatively, you can like put this thing here. It's all the same thing. And and also there's also another thing that so in the message message can take in everything that um, propagate takes. So these two has the same signature. So uh, message can not only take um, take the xj, which is your neighborhood in, uh, neighbor embedding, but it can also take xi. The uh, xi is your self embedding. So your message doesn't have to be like a um, a function of xj only. It can also be a function of xi. You can write something like xi minus. N. It's probably not going to work well, but like you can define a complex model uh, as a function of xi and xj uh, here as as your messages. Um, update here. 
uh, just means that after you do the message passing, after you compute the node embedding, do you have additional layers on top of that to further transform this? For instance, I think in GraphSearch, what we do is I did like a uh, normalized embedding. So I, I think it's like something like this. Uh, like uh, p, like do L two normalization with with the last dimension of the uh, something like. But I'm not. I, yeah, I, I, you can do a normalization. You can do MLP or like anything that's after message passing. Okay. Um, let's check if the. Yeah, uh, I think I think that's it. So so here the the story is that you. Uh, once you write this kind of message passing subclass, you can essentially replace this with the message passing. So let's uh, let's try. Um, yeah. So so essentially, instead of saying uh, where is it? Uh, instead of saying like paygnn dot gcn conf, I can change it to uh, our custom conf. Right. So then you can uh, run 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 your method. Specify how far the messages will go, like the you know, like the depth of your genome. Yeah, the question is how do you specify the depth of, of your model? <coughs> uh, so there, uh, so so this is in the GNN uh, stack. Uh, you rem remember the module list where I put all the counts. So this essentially does three layers, right? I put in one count from input to a hidden. I put a second count on from hidden to hidden, and then this is a loop over two layers. So essentially, in the in the forward function, this, there's also a loop here. So I put I take the input, I try to use the convolution that I just defined. I get the output, and the output is fed back in this loop, right? As input of x. So that's that's the layer. Um. So that is the depth of the network model, but in that because um, we saw in class that. They could also be a set of the neighborhood, so like the chaos. So where, where, where does this happen? Yes. So the question is, I guess, where is the? Right. Uh, where do we? Where do we? Um, right. So the, yes. Uh, um, so so this is uh, still by looking at uh, these few lines. Um, this model list uh, does these three hops. So this is the depth in terms of what Yuri said, like the depth, how far you want to find out. It's not the depth of your neural network layer because every one of these can have multiple layers. And so this is the number of hops you want to go away. So here in the forward, because we have the loop over three layers, so for every, for every time um, you take your input, you would perform your convolution at that layer, and then you get your output, right? And the output is fed back into the input as the input of the next layer. It's just a follow to go over multiple hops. Yeah. Post message passing. Oh yeah. Uh, um, this one. So, um, it, because in practice in graph classification, oftentimes it's beneficial if you have a few more linear, like few more um, um, layers after you finish the message passing. So. Uh, this is just like if you look at the post message passing, this is an end dot sequential as I explained. And then sequential does like every of these layers sequentially. So it performs two layer MLP on top of your graph embedding that ju you just computed. Again, it's not necessary, it's just something we added. So it's just to show that we can customize the model uh, with different architectures. Um, so, yeah. Um, Let's show the training loop here. Uh, yeah, the training loop um, is very similar to the previous one. So uh, in the sense that we build this data loader. And these code are already written for you in the homework. So you can also look at the homework. Uh, the thing to note is that we have this train loader, which loads the data set from the first 80% of the data. And then the test loader is from the 80% to, so the rest of the 20% of the data. So in practice, uh, you have to know that there's also like train validation and test split, right? As you all know, test split is something that you don't want to look at. You look at the validation split at training time, you comp evaluate the performance on validation, and then you can perform some, some kind of early stopping. You see the validation curve goes like, your accuracy increases, but then decreases. You want to make sure like you stop at the, like, 
do some early stopping. And then once you determine the best epoch where your model performs, like the, the epoch that your model performs best, you can use that model to perform on your test set. So test set is like one time thing that you don't look at before you training, uh, before you finish training. Right. So, but here for simplicity, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, doing this train and test split. But um, note that like improper thing, like you have to do train say from to train um, from everything to 0 0.8, and then uh, valid validate on 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, and then you test from 0 0.9 to 1. So you have a different test split. Um, and specify batch size by 64. I also shuffle the data so that I can I can have different ordering of the mini batches. Um, here, um, here is the same. I com construct the model. It's very similar to the MNIST uh, framework. Con construct the model, construct the opt optimizer. Note that I still call uh, all the param parameters. So the optimizer is optimizing all the parameters of your model. And then I start the training loop. The training loop starts with like a, a 200, uh, 200 epochs. And, um, and I just, for every epoch, it's the same. Like I get the mini batch from the loader, um, zero grad, super important. Um, get the prediction. Um, if this is a node classification, um, I also have this mask. So just to clarify this mask thing, uh, uh, because in node classification, a lot of times we have one graph. And in this one graph, we want to do train test split. right? You want to train on nodes, a subset of nodes in the graph, and test on some other nodes that you have not seen before. So this masking is uh, saying, like, you can have a look at those nodes that are not masked out. So these are your training sets. And you mask out all the validation and test set. So this is what this mask is doing. And this mask is also like, um, uh, is defined in the data, data loader. So it's also in your homework, which you can have a look. Uh, um, and at test time, your mask is instead your validation mask or your test mask. So this is a way, like this is how, how we train on a single graph with different train validation and test nodes and in the same graph. But if, it, if this is not a node classification, if this is a graph classification, typically there are a lot of graphs, right? So we just split by graphs. So your train set is say graph one to graph 10, validation is graph 10, graph 11 to graph 13, and so on. Um, and and now um, now we just compute the loss loss um, i uh, so here the loss is um, added uh, to the total loss and we we uh, monitor the loss so note that uh, uh, the add scalar here uh, so this is from the writer so I will explain that later so this is a very good like TensorFlow stuff uh, um, so instead of looking at the loss as we just did in MNIST you know, like printing out every entries it is also very convenient if you can uh, if you write out in TensorBoard. So this is the uh, doing this. So I'm, I'm writing this loss um, uh, with this total loss value and then the epoch. So it will help you plot the graph of the of the loss. Um, uh, and this is testing. So testing uh, does um, it's also very similar, but except the train mask, I'm using a validation mask for node classification. Um, and I'm checking whether the label is equal to the prediction. Um, yeah, it's also it's very similar. Like you loop over all the all the uh, data, all the mini batches in the data loader. Um, but uh, here, note that this is a little bit faster. You don't have to add this, but um, if you set we touch the no grad, you will not compute any gradients. So that will make it slightly faster because at test time you don't optimize, so you don't have to compute gradients there here. Um, So, so this is the TensorBot stuff. Um, that's good. Um, and this is a little bit tricky because we're running on Colab. But uh, if if you're running on the on on like a Python file, you don't have to say all all these. You just like you just need to import the TensorBot X. So this is the URL that they provided. Uh, currently, there is nothing because we haven't started training. But uh, this is. This is a graph classification task. So we are using the IMDB binary graph classification benchmarks. Uh, in your homework, I think I, uh, I think uh, you're given the enzyme data set, but it's very similar. Um, load the data set, um, shuffle the data set, and then start training. The training loop is, remember the training loop is over here. For every epoch, you perform optimization. 
so yeah yeah you can also run it uh i think it's a little bit slow but uh yeah um but let's not waste time uh in the meantime uh, this this is the node classification task so we set task equals to node so which means that you don't uh, you're actually using the masking for the train and validation split um this is just another data set called sites here which is also a citation data set uh, very similar to the coral data set that's in your homework um, but this is in no node classification um, okay so so this is training um, and when it is training um, it will start logging right so the summary writer is from the tensorboard x it will log everything here uh, log everything that where you say like writer where is writer writer dot add scalar will add the scalar to the to this log directory that that you specified here um, so so it, this is just like very random like you can name your log everything like your favorite name of your model um, this is just an example like it will log into that directory and when you log into that directory this HTML uh, um, uh, tensor tensorboard server will retrieve data from that directory from that log directory and then you will see a visualization of that uh, so so this is the name the random name that we just give the give our model uh, we can see the loss function decreasing so this is for every epoch we're doing this add scalar function there so we log the add scalar so we get a plot of this and note that this is also the test accuracy but the difference is that at test time because testing is very expensive uh, you have to look through the entire data set we only perform it every 10 epochs so you will see one data point at every 10 epochs so note that this is also updating because we are running it and generating log um, in real time so this is the this is the ten, uh, tensorboard so it's very simple like just to re reiterate all you need to do is that you import tensorboard x and then you define this writer uh, with the directory that you want to log to and finally you do uh, uh, where is it add scalar right it's very simple um, and you can also log images and so on but that's a bit more involved and I won't talk about it so lastly we just want to look uh, have a look at the visualization here uh, so once you learn these kind of node embeddings no matter from deep work uh, node to vac or GNNs you can always visualize them in 2d to get a sense like how well your um, your embedding is like how well the nodes are clustered together I, I nodes from the same class are close to each other you can answer a lot of these kind of questions just by visualizing this so uh, this is also uh, very simple um, 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 this is just using the standard uh, um, plot uh, plot uh, matplotlib stuff that you all probably already know um, where xs and ys is the tsne embedding here and the tsne embedding uh, is also simple to compute because we have this tsne library from uh, scipy uh, so we call tsne we construct tsne and then we say fit transform and then the input to this fit transform function is our embedding that has been learned so note that this embedding is uh, is an output of the model right remember that in in our model where is our model uh, remember in our model we actually output the embedding right here so it will get the embedding of your uh, graph neural net and it will perform the tsne uh, technique to uh, map this embedding high dimensional embedding into two dimensions so that you can visualize in this 2d plane uh, by calling um, plot or scatter with with the color representing the class of your each node so as we can see like in sites here for instance it's not perfect right uh, there's a lot of nodes that um, are clustered together like in the middle of a brown cluster there's like red node so it's not a perfect one it actually gets like 70 percent accuracy so it's not yeah uh, how do we know if it's an issue with uh the clustering versus with the classifier oh the question is how do you uh, how do we know like if you have something wrong whether it's from the clustering algorithm or whether it's from uh, the classifier so um i think i think the answer is um we we gotta trust these um, these low dimensional embedding tech, uh, techniques. So these are definitely not prefer perfect. The thing is, like if you imagine you have like a three hundred embedding, like three hundred dimension embedding, you want to compress it into two principal components, or like it's not gonna give you like perfect things, right? So so 
I, I think I think it's very hard to determine like whether this is like an artifact or not, uh, especially from this. This is mainly to like show how. Oh. Uh, this this is mainly like show why is it disappearing N never mind so this is this is mainly to show like a, as a comparative study so say like if you have two models uh, uh, one model gives you this visualization and one model gives you that visualization and you observe that that model has a better clustering then given that you use the same Kisney algorithm you think that this one is doing better right but absolute like in absolute scale it's very hard to determine whether like two things are close together, it's really because your method is not good or your Tisney is not good. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, good question, I think. Um, so that's pretty much the end of the tutorial. And lastly, I just want to show you a little bit about the an extra task that is not required in homework. So this is for link prediction, which is also very important that if you're doing knowledge graph y or if you're doing like uh, graph reasoning, it's very important. Basically, it's, tell, uh, it's asking whether you can do completion of knowledge graph or things like that. You can predict whether two, two nodes are linked together uh, in a graph that has a lot of missing edges, like these kind of cases. So this is just using the graph auto encoder, uh, which you can also refer to the Python geometric uh, 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 documentation. So the, the encoder, so this kind of auto encoder has this encoder part and decoder part. So the encoder part here, we use graph convolution. We use graph convolution to get embeddings for all the nodes. That's the encoder part. And at the decoder part, we basically use something very simple. We can use inner product. Right? If the two embeddings have large inner product close to one, then we think there's likely a link between them. And if they're not, then there's no link. So the encoder is graph conf. The decoder is uh, inner product. Right? So here, we define very simple encoder. You're probably already very familiar with this already. Like two layers of graph conf here, this is your encoder, right? Um, and decoder here, um, decoder here we actually didn't specify because the default decoder is in the product. If you want to have fancy in the product, uh, like fancy things like neural tensor network or any other decoder, then you will modify the decoder also. Um, but overall, it's, uh, it's like um, just, um, just defining another NN.module. So, as usual, we do the train test, and we use the site CR data set. So this is also the same data set that we use for uh, node classification, but now we're doing link prediction there. Um, and we're recording these two metrics, AUC and average precision, and both of which are also defined in sklearn. So you can um, uh, use what I, uh, what I said in the, towards the beginning of the class to use sklearn to compute these metrics. Um, so link prediction is also pretty fast. Uh, and one thing that's that's uh, worth noting is that there is the uh, split edges. So this is important function that helps you to construct positive and negative examples of link prediction. Um, as you probably remember uh, in class, you already talked about like you have to construct positive examples and the negative examples by negative sampling, right? And then you uh, you have positive log likelihood minus the log sum of log likelihood of your negative samples. So this is doing this separation between the positive edges and negative edges, right? So um, yeah, this is a good function for link prediction. But other than that, everything is very similar. Um, um, you define the the um, uh, n all the, uh, all these parameters and and uh, make it to GPU and then you run over the model. The uh, this is the train function that we we wrote. So um, so yeah. And again, we can also visualize this. Um, oh. Color is not defined. Uh, I guess I have to run this again just to define the color list. I don't know why it's not defined. But uh, yeah, so the visualization is also very similar. So the, the idea is that we have an encoder that's graph count. We have a decoder that's in the product. The, the thing in the middle is our embedding. So we visualize the embedding in the middle. Um, yes. I don't know why it's slow, but it's the same function as you saw in the previous node classification uh, thing. And and that's it for uh, everything related to Python geometric. And uh, just want, uh, is there any question?
です。